good afternoon <coughs> yesterday we were talking about the twin paradox now i found some a couple of video programs on it i think they are quite nice so let's just quickly run over that this one is uh, a cartoon Sixty Second Adventures in Thought Number 5 The Twin Paradox Albert Einstein didn't have a twin brother, but he had some funny ideas of what you could do with one. He imagined two identical twins. Let's call them Al and Bert. Now Al is a couch potato, but Bert likes to travel. So he hops into a spaceship and zooms off at close to the speed of light. That's when Einstein's special theory of relativity kicks in. It says that the faster you travel through space, the slower you move through time. So from Al's point of view, Bert's time would be moving slower than his own. To put it another way, time might fly when you're having fun, but when clocks fly, they run more slowly in relativity. After a while, Bert decides to head back, still at close to the speed of light, and returns to his brother with his holiday snaps. But when Bert arrives home, Al will now be older than his twin, which makes their double dates a lot more awkward. Although it seems implausible, Einstein just followed his theory to its logical conclusion, and it turns out he was right. This concept of time dilation provides the basis for our global positioning system, which is how your sat-nav knows you need to turn left in 200 yards. But it... <laughs> But why is it called a paradox? Paradox means there's some kind of a logical contradiction, right? Where is the logical contradiction? It lies in the following fact that I was telling you <clears throat> that you can't tell who's moving, right? So, Bert has the equal right to say, I didn't move, Albert did. So, Albert, I should age, not Albert. And Albert can say the same thing about Bert. So who is right? Yet, uh, it is a fact that the guy who goes off in that spaceship is the one who is going to remain younger. The one who stays back will get <coughs> older. Now how, how can you understand that? Because Apparently, special relativity is absolutely symmetrical about who's moving and who's not. I mean, both are equally right. The, what, what will happen is the guy who's going off in that spaceship, as long as there is no acceleration, ignore the initial bit of acceleration, then he sees you whizzing past the other way in the, with the same velocity, same relative velocity, because he doesn't know that he's moving. So if this guy comes back, he should be younger, right? But you look at it from the other point, person's point of view, you get the other conclusion. Now, which is right? Okay, so for that, we need to go to the next video. According to special relativity, time travel into the future is possible. In science fiction, we have time machines, which allow us to go anywhere we want, into the past or the future. In reality, though, as far as we know, only time travel into the future is possible. And it would work like this. Imagine we have two identical twins. One of them gets into a rocket and travels to a star 10 light years away. She moves at 80% the speed of light. When she gets to the star, she turns around and comes back at the same speed. 25 years will have elapsed on Earth, yet only 15 years for the traveler. When she gets out of her spaceship, she's surprised to see that her identical twin has aged an extra 10 years. Theoretically, if you could get your rocket going near the speed of light, and you went as far as the Andromeda galaxy and came back, millions of years will have elapsed on Earth, yet the trip might only take you a few weeks. Now, if you've heard anything about relativity, I'm guessing you've heard moving clocks run slow. And that's a great way to remember how things are different between two frames of reference. But you have to remember that it works both ways. Imagine I zoom past you in my car. From your point of view, you're standing still, I'm doing the moving. And so you observe that my clock is running slow. And that is correct. But from my point of view, my clock is not running slow. 
In fact, I'm not moving. You and the road are moving past me. I notice that your clock is running slow. And that is also correct. Now, this has been confirmed with a lot of experimental evidence. And understanding this, I can now explain what is the twin paradox. According to what I said, each twin should see the other's clock running slow. So why is it that when the trip is over, one twin is 10 years older than the other? One standard explanation is that the symmetry was broken. The rocket twin experiences g-forces to speed up, to do the turnaround, to slow down. The Earth twin never experienced those forces. To me, that explanation is not good enough. Okay, so things are different, so what? Why is it the Earth twin who ages the extra 10 years? Why not the other way around? To make things more confusing, they said it was the g-forces that broke the symmetry. That made me think they were considering the effects of general relativity. In general relativity, we know that accelerating clocks run slow. But that didn't make any sense. You could have the same accelerations for a short trip as for a long trip. The long trip would just have more coasting. And the way we calculated the age difference between the twins, we only needed to know the speed and the distance traveled. To find out more, I took a course in relativity. There we ignored the acceleration. We assumed the rocket could change speed instantly. We're only interested in the effects of special relativity. We did a thought experiment where each twin would send out a radio signal every second. Ping, ping, ping. Those could represent their heartbeats. And then we would count how many pings each one would receive. On the outbound leg of the trip, each twin would receive the other's pings at the same lowered frequency, less than once per second. There's two reasons why the frequency would be lower. One is because each other's clock is running slow, and the other is due to Doppler shift. These two effects are combined into a single relativistic Doppler shift equation. So far, everything is symmetric. Then the twin gets to the star, and she does the turnaround. At that time, she notices her ping frequency go up. She's now getting pings faster than once per second. Meanwhile, back at Earth, that twin continues to get low frequency pings for 10 more years. After everything is done, we calculate how many pings each one got from the other. Both twins agree that it's the Earth twin who ages the extra 10 years. After seeing this calculation, I was still not happy. We had counted how many pings the Earth twin had sent and received. We had counted how many pings the rocket twin had sent and received. But we did all of that from the Earth point of view, where the rocket went out and came back. I figured if we looked at it from the rocket's point of view, it was the Earth that went out and came back, and it would be the rocket twin who aged the extra 10 years. And I found out I could actually force this by allowing something absurd to happen. Going back to the Earth's point of view, when the rocket did the turnaround, that twin noticed the ping frequency go up. So to be symmetric, when the Earth went out and did the turnaround, it would be the Earth twin who would notice the ping frequency go up. And that is absurd. I finally understand how this breaking of symmetry thing works. It has to be the rocket twin who sees the ping frequency go up at the turnaround. And when you work the problem that way, you get the same answer no matter which frame of reference you use. The trick is in understanding why it has to be the rocket twin who noticed the ping frequency go up 10 years before the Earth twin. In general, when they're approaching, they will each get high frequency pings from each other. And when they're going apart, they'll each get low frequency pings. But when the rocket twin did the turnaround, she was 10 light years away. At that time, there were all these pings spread out in space between the two points, going in both directions. If the rocket twin would have stopped transmitting at the turnaround, the Earth twin would continue to get pings for 10 more years. And they would all be at the lower frequency because they were all transmitted while the rocket was moving away. On the other hand, the rocket twin notices the ping frequency go up right away because she just turned around and is now going back into those pings head on. If you've never understood relativity and would like to, I recommend watching the teaching company course on relativity. Anyone who's made it through middle school can easily understand it by watching this short DVD course. Relativity is as certain as death and taxes, and understanding it is way more fun. I hope this makes you sufficiently confused. <laughs> The idea is to tell you that these are very difficult concepts and people are still writing papers on this question. But experimentally it is correct. What Einstein said is correct. The guy who goes off in a space rocket and comes back <coughs> stays younger than the twin, identical twin who stays back. That is correct. That has been 
experimentally demonstrated also. But understanding this is not that simple. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the reasons that uh, I think everybody should learn a little, uh, the, certain basic things about physics is that first of all it's extremely exciting because so many bizarre things are predicted and then found to be true. And therefore this has an impact on our traditional knowledge. And therefore it is time that people s sit up and take notice of these new developments. And these new developments are done by literally millions of people working and conferencing and discussing and using logic. And uh, there is a, therefore a lot of truth in all this, which cannot be, or which is, can only be ignored at your own peril. Because then you're, you're just going to be left <coughs> stranded in the past. Okay, so now I go on to talk about the next generalization of Einstein's theory of relativity, which is the general theory of relativity. And why did Einstein, why was Einstein not satisfied with special theory of relativity, which was so fantastic anyway? The reason is that <clears throat> this is restricted to only one kind of motion, uniform motion, that is motion in a straight line with a constant velocity. But everywhere we see all other kinds of motion, accelerated motion, motion of the planets, which go round the sun, so that's not a straight line motion. <coughs> so, what happens there? So he has to somehow change the theory to take into account accelerated motion. That is motion in a straight line which is accelerated or decelerated, that is when you start your car or you stop your car or when you <coughs> take a bend. If you drop an object, it falls to the ground. This famous example of the apple falling and hitting Newton on the head. Now when you drop an object, at the moment when you release it, its speed is zero. But when it hits the ground, it has picked up speed, which means it has accelerated. If you drop it from a high tower, the speed with which it hits the ground is going to be much, much more than if you drop it through a small height. Right? So it is accelerating. That is, it's constantly its speed is increasing. So gra what we call gravity, causes acceleration, right? Okay, so also we know from Newton's theory that the moon goes round this earth because the earth, there's a gravitational force between the earth and the moon and also the earth goes round the sun because there's a gravitational interaction between the sun and the earth. That's what makes the earth go round. If the gravitational force weren't there, the earth would just coast along in a straight line. Now there is another very important fact, we'll come to this later, but I can show it, demonstrate it here, I don't know whether I demonstrated it last time, which is that all objects fall equally fast. We think that lighter objects fall slower than heavier objects, but that's just wrong. I can show it to you now. Do you want me to show it? Yes. Okay. Give me a piece of paper. Yeah, any, any, any A4 sheet of paper. And give me a, give me a book. Anything, anything heavy. Okay, good. Now, if I drop this, which one will fall faster? 
Physics is great fun. You should actually do experiments instead of just thinking. If you do it, you learn a lot. And it's so simple to do these experiments. Okay. Have I destroyed somebody's notes? <laughs> so I, this will fall later than this, right? Yes. Okay. Now I'll show you one way in which both will fall equally at the same time. I'm not holding on to it, right? <laughs> what happened? What, what was the difference? What is the difference? <laughs> hmm? Why do they stay together? There's no glue. No glue. <laughs> I'm not a magician. This is Agni, actually. It's not a trick. This is the kind of experiment which Galileo did, but slightly different in a different way. I'll do another. I'll just crumple the paper. Which which will fall faster? Tell me. Book. Book. Same. So what is happening? <laughs> what is happening? It's the air here which is pushing on the paper because the paper is the density is very small. So the air, there is an air resistance. Whereas the book is so dense that that air resistance doesn't matter, it goes through. So what I did was I placed the book below the paper. So now when the book falls, under the paper there is no air. So it falls at the same time. So therefore it is the air which makes things fall differently. But if you were in vacuum, there was then no air, everything will fall at the same time. And this is the famous law of Galileo. And this forms one of the basic ideas of Einstein's theory of general relativity, that all things fall equally fast in gravity. The Earth messes up things by having an atmosphere around it. If you went to the moon, everything will fall at the same time. Okay? Physics is made boring in textbooks, <laughs> but physics is extremely interesting when you actually get involved with it and do it. And it is also quite simple. <clears throat> okay, now I will go to a set of lectures which I'll give now. So people say the general relativity is Einstein's greatest discovery and in fact mankind's greatest discovery ever. It is absolutely a fantastic theory and it changes everything. Okay, so Einstein did many, many things. Even one of them would have made him world famous. But he was so great, he did many, many things. I think if you people can come here, you will see better, right? Can you see? You can see. Oh, good, good eyesight. <laughs> right. So, um, anyway, I, this is just don't worry about these things. We will take up some of them later on in the lecture, like wave-particle duality. We've covered E equal to mc square, special relativity. We'll come to the light quantum later. But let's see why he went to his general theory of relativity and what are the principal things ideas that he used. On your left, you see a 
page from a very old book of geometry, Euclid's geometry, which you study in school, right? Parallel lines never meet. The three angles of a triangle always add up to 180 degrees and things like that, okay? So that's geometry. And then you have also motion. These are, imagine them to be atoms of a gas moving around randomly. So there's, there's geometry, there's motion. And also you have gravity, weight. Now, you must understand actually what is weight and how it is recorded. Can anybody tell me? People say that when you go in a spacecraft, you are weightless. And some people say because there is no gravity there. That is nonsense. Of course there is gravity. Otherwise, why is it going round? So what is, first of all, what is weight and how is it measured? Can you tell me? What happens when you stand on a weighing machine? Think about it. What happens when you stand on, an away, on a weighing machine? There is a spring there. And the heavier you are, the more you, depress, more you compress it, right? And the more it gets compressed, there is a... It, it, it swings more. Now, the makers of the weighing machine, they put known weights, like one kilo, two kilo, three kilo, and so on, and see where the, arrow, where the, the pointer goes, and he marks it accordingly. That's called a graduation, graduating the scale. And once you have done that, now you put any unknown weight, and from the position of the pointer, you can say what is its weight. Okay? So this is how weight weight is measured. You stand on it and it swings and you read out your weight. Now, now, we'll come to this later. What will happen if you are in a lift, standing on a weighing machine and somebody cuts the cable and you are falling freely? Don't get afraid. <laughs> it's only a thought experiment, what will happen? Will you record a weight? From ex the experiment I just showed you now, tell me, while you are falling, will you see any weight or you will see zero weight? But you are standing on the weighing machine. Think. <coughs> what? Zero weight. How many people think it will be zero weight? How many people think that the weight will be the same? Both answer nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I'm not going to give you marks of pass you or fail you. So, so tell me. I think it will be zero. You think it will be zero. How many people agree with her? Two. Only two. But she's right. Why should it be zero? Because the left, uh, because the guy is in the left, so the left, left is literally stopping. Uh, huh? Because the guy is, the guy who's in the left, the lift is uh, literally uh, stopping. The, um, yeah, the lift is falling, and the guy is falling at the yes. same time. So you are not pressing the, you are no longer pressing on the, on the spring. The spring is falling and you are falling. So how will it show any weight? So you'll see zero weight. That's called weightlessness. Weightlessness happens when there is gravity. When there is no gravity, question of weight does not come in any case. That's trivial. So this is also a very fundamental thing that if you fall together, if you are falling freely, you become weightless. Right? Okay, now we'll go ahead. So he combined these three things, geometry, motion, and gravity. 
and he came to the conclusion that gravity is the curvature is the curvature of the geometry of space-time now you're confused what am I saying gravity is the curvature of the geometry of space-time what do you mean by geometry of space-time now you know the geometry of space right if I draw a triangle you can tell me that if you add the angles you'll get 180 degrees etc etc if you have a two parallel lines and you have another two parallel lines cutting them you get a parallelogram and you have certain geometrical properties of it the two sides of the parallelogram will always be equal and parallel and all this this is called Euclid's geometry Euclidean geometry now we have already seen that <coughs> the special theory of relativity brings in time in a very essential way before relativity <laughs> Einstein's relativity space and time were two different things one had nothing to do with the other but once you have special relativity you can't do that space and time form one fabric which is four-dimensional because space is three-dimensional you know that space is three-dimensional you know that X Y Z so if you want to know where this particle is you must know how far it is from that wall how far it is from that wall and how far it is from the floor you have to give three numbers giving two numbers will not fix it position right supposing you say it is so many feet from this wall and so many feet from that wall will it fix the position no because it can be anywhere on that line so you have to give a third number so that is why space is called three-dimensional you need three minimum three numbers to specify the position of a of an object now when you have imagine a four-dimensional world where the fourth dimension is time then what is the point in that world the point in that world has three coordinates X Y Z as well as time so what is it <coughs> it is an event this glass is here at 425 this glass is not there at 425 plus something so the glass being here is an event the glass being there is an event so the whole world actually is a collection of events and therefore this world is actually four-dimensional one of them being time so now you get a more dynamic point view point than just space which is static now everything is evolving with time events now what is the geometry of that four-dimensional world that is the question is it Euclidean will Euclid's theorems hold in such a world Einstein found no and we'll, we'll come to that I just gave you the answer okay so let's proceed step by step now normally <clears throat> time is always shown as something vertical so here is the earth going round the sun if you if you if you think of it in terms of time then it is going like this right a long time if this is the time axis then the earth goes like this because whenever it comes back here this is the second year this is the third year they are not at the same place in time but when you see an uh, orbit you think that it is it's always coming back to the same point it is not coming back to the same point it is the time has passed it is gone to another point along the timeline okay so it's like a spiral isn't it any difficulty no and what makes it go like that 
according to you, uh, Newton's theory is gravity. Otherwise, it would go just in a straight line. The fact that it is going round is because of gravity, according to Newton. But there's a problem with this, I'll come to that. So Einstein said, no, the earth just goes around that, because the geometry of space and time is like that. There's no force which is pulling it. It is space which is pushing it. Space itself is a physical entity which is pushing it. And that's why it is going around. Something drops. Is it because this is attracting it? That's Einstein, that Newton would say yes. Einstein said no, no. The space is pushing it. Now, this is just another way of saying the same thing. But so, yes, you have to go and develop it much further. So, with this idea, he published this paper in Annalen der Physik in 1916. So, from 1905 to 1916, it took him so many years, 11 years, to <coughs> develop this theory. And as you will see, he'd made many, many false and wrong <coughs> steps. That each one was better than the previous one, but each one had an effect. And he kept on and on and on. And as you'll see in his biography, he fell ill. All kinds of things happened. So this is the way science is actually done. We only come to know the final picture, not the struggle which a physicist or a scientist goes through. Okay, we'll come to that. Now, let's get back to Newtonian gravity and special relativity. Now here you have the sun and the earth and this, according to Newton, sun's gravity pulls instantly on the earth. What does that mean? That means supposing you think in your mind that the planets are going around the sun but something happens and the sun simply vaporizes, goes, there's no sun. What will happen to the planets? Each one will, instead of going round like that, will just shoot off like that. If you tie a stone or a ball with a string and do that, whirl it, it will be going round, but just release the string. What will happen? It will just fly off tangentially. So exactly the same will happen with planets. But it will happen at the very instant that the sun disappears. So there is an instantaneous action, but at a great distance. Einstein was aware, uh, sorry, Newton was aware of it, but he couldn't do any better. What he did stayed for 300 years, and what he did is still being used and still being used to send people to the moon and other planets. It's just Newton's theory. It still works. But conceptually there is a problem. The problem is with light and its properties. We have seen from Einstein's theory of special relativity, which is right, that nothing can go faster than light. Right? It's an absolute thing. Therefore, if something happens to the sun, that message will take time to go to the earth. It cannot, the earth cannot feel its absence immediately. That just, that violates the axioms of special relativity theory or the consequences of special relativity theory. Because relativity theory says you can't send any message faster than light in vacuum. Therefore, there's something wrong with Newton's theory. Have you understood it? So that has to be corrected. So this is the point. So special theory says C is the limit. So somehow or other, if the sun disappears, that message should take time to travel to the planets. 
uh, this is Albert Einstein working in his patent office where he didn't have he was asked to write an article in by a journal and this is what he wrote to the journal and the journal uh, the the editor of the journal was another very famous man Johannes Stark unfortunately he was a Nazi man but anyway I'm not able to acquaint myself with everything published on the subject he was asked to write a review article and this is what he's writing because the library is closed during my free time <laughs> You would therefore do me a great favor if you could bring to my attention other publications if you know about each, about such. So you see, he was working under great strains. So this is the law of falling bodies that I have just now demonstrated. The story goes that he, Galileo dropped these balls from the top of the tower. So all bodies fall alike independently of their masses, provided of course, of course he dropped rather heavy balls so that the air resistance wasn't appreciable. So he found this. If he had dropped a feather, he would have found that it was not falling at the same time. But he knew that this was because of air. However, supposing you also, instead of just dropping the ball, you also throw the balls this way. Instead of dropping it, just, just releasing your hand, you just throw it. So it will come down in a parabola. And Einstein calculated what would happen according to his special theory of relativity if you had this extra motion, horizontal motion. And he found that they wouldn't come down at the same time. But the difference will be very, very minute. So he was worried. He said, there's something wrong with my special theory of relativity because Galileo's law is correct. I mean, we know that everything falls at the same time. So if my theory is saying that it doesn't fall, happen when I push them horizontally, you see, even if you push objects horizontally, supposing you, you, have, you have one object which you drop just straight like that and another object which you shoot like that, both at the same time you will find both will hit the ground at the same time. You can do it and see it. When I do workshops with school children, I make them do that. And you can see there is no difference. But according to special theory of relativity, there should be a difference. So there is trouble for special theory of relativity. There is something not quite correct. Now, if you have a gas, you can increase its temperature. When you increase the temperature, what happens to the molecules? They fly around more rapidly in all kinds of directions. So there is horizontal motion. So suppose you have a gas of a box of cool gas and a box of hot gas, and if you drop them, then according to special relativity, the hot gas will come down later than the cold gas. So Einstein said, but that is contradicting a known law which has been known since Galileo. So there is something wrong. So I have to correct it. And then he found what was necessary. And he has said that this is the happiest thought of my life. And what is it? He discovered what is called the principle of equivalence. And this is a fantastic principle. Very simple. But you have to, you, let's take a little bit of time to understand what it is. The whole of the general theory of relativity is based on this. And this is nothing but the experiment that we have already discovered. <clears throat> Supposing you are out there in space where there is no gravitational field. Imagine it. Imagine you are there and you are standing in a box and without your knowledge, so, okay, the first thing is you have lots of objects floating around because there is no gravitational field, nothing is falling and you are weightless. Now somebody starts pulling the box up 
with a certain acceleration and you are not aware of it. Suddenly what will happen? The balls will come down to the floor because they are where they are but the floor will come up. So you will see the balls falling and when the floor comes up, you will feel the pressure. So you will suddenly feel weight. If there was a weighing machine, it will press against your feet and it will show a weight. So you will suddenly think, oh God, there is a gravitational field has been generated in this box, right? And there will be no way that you can say it is not a gravitational field. It is a gravitational field. But the mind outside, it says, no, 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 this is not a gravitational field. It's just you are being accelerated, right? Which is correct. <clears throat> now Einstein says, I say both are right. And so he makes it a principle. And the principle simply says that it is impossible to distinguish between gravity and acceleration. The two are identical, of course, in a small region of space time. Because if you, you see, you know that gravity, the acceleration due to gravity varies. If you go deep inside a mine, it will be different from what it is on the surface of the earth <coughs> and on the top of a mountain or if you go very far away it's not the same, it changes it's not a uniform gravitational 